if we're going to be, you know, it's easy, it's going to be easy for us to find all the things that are wrong with the ecosystem and all the things standing in the way, and we should continue that conversation. But let's talk about some of the solutions that are actually already in place. So we know now more about the, the genomics of cancer than we ever have before. If you've got a specific biomarker for a specific tumor in a specific patient, and then there's a therapeutic uh, intervention, that patient ought to get that therapy. Once we've assumed that it's safe and it's, there's no untoward effect. Although in cancer, we, don't, we care less about the safety because these are life-saving therapies that we have. Now, one thing that the, the, the FDA has done very, very well is worked with uh, stakeholders and actually created a breakthrough therapy pathway such that at the earliest signs of efficacy and evidence, those therapies can be rushed through to patients. So what has ordinarily taken, what, eight to 10 years from idea conception to patient, can now, or more, can now be compressed in a, in a more favorable time frame so we can speed these therapies. These are the kinds of solutions that are smart, they're intelligent, they're science-based, and they're really involving all members but, of the But ecosystem. let me ask you about the economic model. I mean, thinking about what if, in fact, there is an extremely limited number of patients with those biomarkers. So what is the economic model for a company like yours if the number of people who are actually going to benefit because of the particular uh, 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 gene-based aspect of that disease are so small? How, how, how do your investors make uh, money on that unless the price becomes so astronomical that our system can't afford to reimburse for it without, or individuals can't pay for it without bankruptcy? Well, let, let's use one example. And, 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 and Monsep, please jump in too. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll do this very quickly. Uh, Pfizer, one of, the, one of the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical companies, devised a genomic-based therapy for lung cancer. The number of patients who are actually have that particular genomic marker or mutation is less than 5% of all patients who have lung cancer. Those patients ought to get the therapy, but what we don't know is whether that same therapy would be effective in patients who don't have the marker. And that's going to be a whole field of interesting exploration that the industry is now beginning to open up. So we think linearly and logically, if you've got the gene mutation, there's a drug, you ought to get it. What we need to ponder is if you don't have the gene mutation, because cancer therapies work in so many different ways against the basic disease process of cancer, is there an opportunity that even if without that genomic marker, that you could benefit? And that's a question we don't know the answer to. And of course, we're also finding out, on the... I didn't mean to jump in, but Sorry. that some of the, the markers for one kind of a cancer actually appear in other kinds of cancers. So we, we're actually finding that some of the therapies developed in the context of, of one form of cancer are applicable to other forms of cancer, too. So, I mean, the, the last breakthroughs in cancer, one of the medicine the FDA just approved as part of our pipeline a few weeks ago and, and from another company about a year and a half ago, there was only nine years from discovering the mutation to actually the medicine being approved. So it's much faster. Attrition, so rate of failure is much lower than with other medicine discoveries. Uh, and therefore, the cost of, of discovering and developing this medicine, and I know this is a sensitive subject, but our company decided to, uh, to build trust and be completely transparent about it in the community. Uh, and we decided to price our medicine substantially lower than the other medicine that exists because it costs less to discover it is one. The other thing I think is we need to aim for much higher benefit to justify those kind of, of, of medicines. So if we're gonna go into personalized medicines with you know, point mutations, et cetera, it should come with faster development, cheaper development, higher benefit, and therefore can sustain a higher price or a reasonable price if the population is smaller. On the subject that Peggy was talking about earlier, which is on the regulatory <coughs> sciences, you know, I'd like to build up on it and say, you know, for Alzheimer's disease, for instance, the FDA is in a position that no other party in the industry is, which is the FDA can see what different companies are doing and sometimes reproducing the same mistakes or going the wrong way. Uh, and, and the FDA, I think, I would really encourage just to help drive towards a pre-competitive partnership between the regulatory agencies and the pharmaceutical companies 
in particular diseases, and maybe we should take Alzheimer's as a first one, and do something that looks like the Framingham cohort uh, or other cohort studies that were done 40, 50 years ago, where maybe we take half a million individuals and study them for a period of 30, 40 years, and during that whole period, various members in the industry, in a pre-competitive way, regulators, etc., nest studies of biomarkers, etc., that can really help set the ground for new medicines to be approved in, in a regulated way and, and truly scientific way. I personally believe it's one of the only ways we're going to target diseases like, like Alzheimer's or the burden of obesity.